Good morning, East End. I dressed up for y'all. Can you tell? I haven't had earrings on in two years. It's all for you. I bring greetings today. I know I don't look like Tom Scott, uh, but we are kicking off our stewardship campaign today. And Tom was going to be here, so I want to represent him for a moment and tell you about it. We're going to be involved this month. The whole month of October is Stewardship Month. And I want for, for all of you, and especially you Methodists in your growing up years, that word uh, stewardship comes from the word steward. And when I was a young girl, we had the Board of Stewards, which was we now call the Administrative Council. But it was the Board of Stewards. And steward means servant. That's what the word means. And Jesus saw himself as a servant. He presented himself as a servant. And that word steward is the way that it re is represented in our church now. And for all of us who have joined into this church, we know that we promised to be a servant. We promised that we would support the church with our, with our time, with our talent, with our witness, with our prayer, and with our gifts. And this month, we will be in our campaign looking to ask you to support the church with your gifts because we use those pledges to plan our budget for next year. It's very, very important. So you'll be hearing about the stewardship campaign. But I want to share this little side note about it. Two things. I worked with Judy Hoffman for six years on this, and she had a little phrase. She said, Naomi, the stewardship campaign is an opportunity for us to give our church family a chance at joyful giving. That was her phrase, joyful giving. It was an opportunity for us to share the wealth that we have in our lives, our resources, in God's work, both in our church and in our community. But I loved her phrase, joyful giving, because it does lift you up to be a part of something that is bigger than you are, bigger than I am. But we had not had one in two years. We have not had a stewardship campaign in two years. And I knew that it was time we had to do it in October. That's the month you do it. And I'm going to be real frank right here. I didn't know who in the world was going to do it. And I'd worried to death about who was going to do it. It requires a lot of planning. And one day I'm sitting in the Kroger parking lot. This is the truth. I'm in the Kroger parking lot and my phone dings. And I look down and there's a text from Tom Scott. And he said, Naomi, I will take the stewardship campaign. I was just stunned. He said, Lara and I will be in charge of that. And I felt my whole heart lift up because I had not asked him to do that. He stepped up and said, I will take the stewardship campaign. And he was going to be here this morning to do the greeting, but he and Laura both have COVID. And they are quarantined over there somewhere in their house. And so I'm here in his place to tell you that it's an exciting time for our church because we can lift up our church, we can lift up what we do, what we mean to each other, what we mean to the community. And this is the month that we show what, how our own commitment is to this church. 
So you'll be hearing from us as we begin our stewardship campaign. Kim, I think you've got the ball right here. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so if you've been following the great progress Warner Elementary has been making, they are a blue ribbon school this year, and they've had a lot of increased enrollment, which is a blessing and not so great for us because what that means is the storage space that we've been enjoying behind the stage is no longer going to be available to us. It's actually going to become offices. So if you are involved in worship setup, um, have stuff that has been stored here. If you could stay a few minutes after church, we need to figure out um, what are the few essentials that we're going to be able to keep it keep here, um, and we're going to have to figure out what are we going to do with the rest of the stuff. So, um, so if you do see a pared down worship experience, know that it's not because we don't um, want to have it, but we also need to make sure that we're right sizing it so that we're focusing on the worship and not a lot of effort into setup. So um, so if people could stay after church, hopefully it will take 15, 20 minutes really trying to get it quickly done so that we can make some decisions. And then I am going to hand off to our guest today, um, Diaz Jer Jerry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's, good, it's good to be with you again on the second week. I do have an announcement for you I'd like to make on behalf of Bishop McAlilly and the Tennessee Western Kentucky Conference that your new senior pastor will be the Reverend Brandon Baxter. You may clap. <laughs> Brandon is a wonderful uh, young man. He and his wife have two girls and he currently is serving at West End United Methodist Church. He will be starting this week uh, with meetings related to East End. Also, uh, Brandon had a previous commitment that was in place, so his first Sunday morning with you will be the 16th, unless that plan changes. But I'm very excited. Brandon is a wonderful individual. I'm sure many of you already know Brandon. And uh, looks like our our other preachers on staff are giving a smile and a big nod, and they're okay with it, I hope. <laughs> well, let, let us pray a prayer blessing, please. Holy God, it is wonderful for us to be together and to share in this moment. We pray, oh God, as a new chapter in East End is beginning, that you would bless the church, that you would bless Brandon Baxter and his family, and may that blessing flow through them and into the community that all will see that they are loved and that you will be glorified and we pray this in Jesus name amen I have a couple of other announcements um, less exciting <laughs> Uh, but we just wanted to make sure everyone knows that we will have worship here at Warner next week under the leadership of our own Joe Lee, and as well as having the church retreat at Bershaba this weekend. And if you have any further questions about that, please do not hesitate to contact me. Overall, I think we are going to have just a beautiful weekend um, as East End United Methodist Church um, and then the following, just a couple announcements. If you're planning on Creative Connections, they did shift the date to October 16th for that. And we are also starting a Parents of Youth group on October 16th um, during UMY at Aldersgate as well. So we have a couple things coming. coming. We're continuing to be and, and do and live into our calling as the church. And... Um, to be the people God called us to be together. And in that spirit, let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship.
please stand in body and spirit and join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship the one who has gathered us together. We worship you, God, the one who pursues us in love. Come, let us worship the one who has uniquely created each one of us. We worship you, God, who has given us purpose and hope. Come, let us worship the one who calls us beloved. We worship you, God, who calls us together to grow in service and in love. Let us worship God together. Please remain standing if you are able and join us in the opening hymn, A Place at the Table, which is found in your insert.
As we begin our time together for the prayers of the people, I just want to remind us that we um, are the people and that what is beautiful about this gift that is called the church is that we um, are caring for one another, walking alongside one another, um, that we are not alone in this. So I invite those who may have joys or concerns that they want to share to raise their hands. And we have folks with microphones. Um, here's someone up, in up here in the front. What a joy. What a joy when people are using their gifts. Also, if you didn't get the message, uh, our children are dismissed to go to Children's Church with Pastor Joanna. Um, and thank you, Anne, for sharing that joy. Do we have any other joys or concerns before us this morning? Gail Ponder, prayers for, and for all the folks suffering um, after the hurricane. for them and if you'll watch our church communications um, when I get the information from UM4 on how our Methodist responses in the hurricane I'll be sure to pass that along in our communications do we have another any other joys or concerns okay all right um, I this prayers of the people I was sharing with our um, morning coffee conversation Sunday school group that some of the words that I have been using to comfort myself in times of transition, and there's been a few, um, are the new creed that we sometimes say together, the, the UCC creed. And so this prayers of the people, you'll find those words woven in, but the, the message for me is that God is with us and that we are not alone. And, that, um, and I speak that for those victims of the hurricane and, and for all those who are suffering or or not suffering. God is with us and we are not alone. Let us go to God in prayer. God of love, in you we are not alone. Your whole created world is filled with your presence and your creative work continues in the coming of Christ who demonstrated his love for the world and the way of walking in his love and in the spirit that connects us even now in this room, in deep love, 
the same love that calls us to be the church, celebrating the gifts of life, of love, and of freedom, of redemption, and of joy. And all of that comes from you. And for that, we give you thanks. God, you call us in love to stand with our neighbors and with strangers and we and with each other. And God, we lift up to you those who have been affected and displaced by Hurricane Ian, um, with those immigrants who have been displaced by politics and in their arrival and their attempt to seek refuge. And we lift up all those globally who feel displaced and out of a home. And, and we lift up this congregation that continues to to walk through uh, challenges in, in our meeting space, challenges that are also beautiful celebrations, that things are happening that honor your kingdom. And the school is growing, and we continue to pray for all of the teachers and faculty and staff and students that are in these walls throughout the week. We pray that they would know love and support. God, you call us to reconciliation and we lift up those who are in broken relationships in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in the systems that are not sufficiently serving those who need help and health and wholeness. Guide us in this way of reconciliation and in peace that we might both give and receive grace and forgiveness. And in that, we might be people who seek justice and resist evil and do it together and bring a little more light to this world. God, when we feel discouraged or disappointed or frustrated, help us to remember that you, God, are with us in life, in death, and in life beyond death, that you are with us and we are not alone. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 is a call for unity and a description of the new hope that Christians have in Jesus. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and both becoming mature, attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I really, uh, I want to ask you to go on a little journey with me this morning. I grew up in North Mississippi in that old red clay down there. I don't know if you've ever been, but it's one of the poorest places in the world. And when I grew up, it was just the heart of poverty in the South. And out there, out from Iuka, Mississippi, is a little United Methodist Church. It's about as big as this room, maybe. And it's out there in that red clay of North Mississippi. It's about five miles outside of Iuka. Now, Iuka is out, but Snowdown is really out, and that's where the church is. And that's where my people are buried for the last six generations are in that red clay behind that church in North Mississippi. And I've always wondered why I'm a Methodist, Johnny. I'm a Methodist because that's the only church there was. And I'm just thankful it wasn't the snake handlers or somebody like that. <laughs> I could have been anything. I could have been a Pentecostal. I could have been a holiness. I could have been anything. But as it turned out, it was a little old Methodist church out there where my folks met at a singing and where they married later on. And I go out there in that little cemetery, and I can see all my people back to the 1840s. And not one of them had much. It was so poor. And the, the reason for it was, when I was born, was that there was no electricity out there at all. There had never been any rural efforts to put electricity in North Mississippi. And not only that, they had used that red clay to grow cotton for decades. And it had bleached out that, that red clay and all the nutrients out of it till it was so poor and eroded. And that was true right on up through the Great Depression and into the New Deal under FDR. And in the late 30s, as a part of the New Deal, FDR created what is called the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA. And they came into North Mississippi and North Alabama, and it was a regional development effort to bring us out of the absolute worst poverty in this country, I do believe. And they came in and they taught our farmers how to farm. All the things that we take for granted now, like contour farming, rotating crops, using fertilizer, all new. And they came in and they did, they put dams up and down the Tennessee River. They took that river that was wild as the wind and they put in dams all the way up and down it so that we could have electricity, hydroelectric power. And in doing that, they were able to bring in people to help our people rise up above that terrible situation of not having anything. Now, my daddy, in the late 1930s, was working at what was called a gravel pit. A gravel pit was where they would take the side of a hillside that they had found that had sedimentary rock in it. And they would dig those rocks out, or what we would call gravel, and they would take that gravel onto a truck and try to make the roads passable in the wintertime. All of those rural roads around where I grew up. Well, in the late 1930s, my daddy was digging gravel. And we're not talking about it with a bobcat. We're not talking with a front end loader. We're talking about a pick and a shovel. And he was making, I started to say, a living wage, no, it was a dying wage for our family. And all of a sudden, TVA came in and my daddy went down and applied to work. It was right before I was born. 
and they took him on construction. And the idea was that he was going to help them build those dams up and down the Tennessee River. And here's where the story gets interesting to me. When I was born, from the time I was born to the time I was in the fifth grade, I moved 17 times. It was just a part of my life because he was what we call following the job. When the job on one down was getting done and finished, he knew he had to move on, and this is really true. He would come home in the afternoon and he would say, tomorrow we move. And what that meant was that we put everything we had on the truck, and the only thing different about mo <laughs> moving day is that mother didn't cook. And we had a loaf of bread from the store, and that is, exactly what happened and we would move up and down the river and we lived in houses that weren't finished where you could see the roof even the rafters we lived in houses that had no electricity no running water we lived in every and let me just tell you the reason why there was no rental property available this is before condos and apartments there were no houses available the only houses that were available were those that where somebody had died and left it there, and they couldn't decide what to do with it. And so we would come into Camden, Tennessee, or we would come into Iuka or Sheffield, Alabama, or wherever it was we were going, and my daddy would ride up and down the street till he saw an empty house. And then he would find out who owned it and go and find that person and ask them if they would rent it to us. Now, I think all of you know that I was born late uh, I, my mother was in her 40s when I was born. I am what they call a menopause baby. And, uh, and so I'm left there with them. I'm this young child. And he would go up to the door and knock on the door to ask them if we could rent. And they, they would look out at me in the car. I could see it from the car. They would look out like this and they'd see me and they'd say, no way. They didn't want to rent to anybody with children because they were afraid that I would tear it up, I guess. That's the only explanation I have. And so it was very, very, very difficult to find a place to live. And finally, my daddy said when, he said, well, we're gonna move in Aunt Tinny's house. My old Aunt Tinny had died out from Iuka, out from Snowdown. I'd say at least eight miles on a gravel road. And she had died and left a four room clapboard house I mean in the sticks. There was nothing there. No electricity, no running water. And so we moved in Aunt Tinny's house. I was four years old. But here's what I want to say to you. I moved 17 times, but it never bothered me. It never affected me. I never worried about it all those years. I, the thing that made it all work was that we moved together. It didn't matter where we lived. We were all together as a family. And it did, did not feel any different to me, one place to another. Because when you look up and you see your mom and daddy and she's making biscuits, it's all the same. We moved into Aunt Tinny's house in the fall of the year, I'd say about this time. And it, it didn't have anything. It was four rooms, no insulation, and it was like now where you have these warm days and cool nights, just like now. And my daddy had a big old warm morning heater that burned coal. And he would set that heater in the front room. The front room is what we call a living room now. And he would put that heater in the front room and he would build a big fire in the morning out of coal before he left to go to work. And during the day, that heater would just heat up the house. It would just warm it all up. And it was wonderful. But we couldn't have heat at night. We couldn't have fire at night. It was too dangerous. That house was a tinderbox. It would have gone up in nothing. And so he let the he would let the fire burn down during the day and into the evening. And so by the time we went to bed, the house would be cooling off. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm sleeping in that back room. By two o'clock in the morning, the house would be really cold. 
and I'm sleeping back there. And do you remember when you were little that you would wake up at night and you'd know something was wrong, but you were not sure what it was. You'd kind of get yourself awake like that, and you, and you, and I, I could remember, you know, and I'd wake up, and I, you know, I, I would realize, I'd say, Mother, I'm cold, I'm cold. And I would hear her feet hit that floor. And she would be coming across those one by eight boards, no carpet, no rug, eight by, eight inches wide planks, and I would hear those footsteps coming. And I, when I would hear them in the darkness, and it was pitch black dark, no electricity, but I could hear her coming. And she would come to the end of that bed, and in her arms, I couldn't see it, but I knew that she would have a quilt over her arms. And she would walk up to the end of that bed and she would take that quilt by the corners and she would snap that quilt out over the bed in the darkness and I could hear it snap and I could feel that whoosh when it would come down on top of me. And she would say, there you are, Carl. There you are, Carl. Now you'll feel better. Now I felt better because she brought the quilt. But I also felt better because she came. To know to be awake at night, to be sick, to be scared, to be cold, to be in need, and to yell out and say, Mama, I'm cold, and to hear those footsteps. There's nothing like that. And she would take that quilt, and my whole life would be lifted up because she brought it and I was safe. And what I learned from those experiences, it didn't matter where we went. It didn't matter where we lived. It didn't matter what we had. It was that we were all together. And it looked the same to me. Because I didn't have to worry. I knew how things were going to be. And this is the quilt. This is the quilt from 80 years ago. And this is the quilt that was at Snowdown. This is the quilt that has been everywhere in the South. This is the quilt my mother made. Now I want you to take a look at it. It's nothing special. There is no design really to this quilt. You can go up to Gatlinburg and spend $2,000 on a quilt. And it will have this beautiful Dutch, the Dutch uh, doll or the, or the log cabin or the butterfly. They'll have a pattern. And it will be made out of beautiful material. But let me tell you about this quilt. This quilt is made out of the rags of our household. It was made out of what we call flower sacks. And it was made out of the dresses I wore and the dresses my mother wore. You can see them all in here. I want you to look at it. It's still holding together. And it's been a long way. And it's been used a lot. But what I want to say about it is that none of these squares really match. They're all pieces and scraps. They're all remnants. And when I look at this quilt, I think about East End. I think about the fact that we all came together and we're just these pieces from all different backgrounds, all different experiences. Some in church, some not in church, some in some other church. All of our pain, all of our, ba all of our baggage all come together in this quilt. And I want you to see how the disparate the disparate parts all come together to do something good. All these ragtags have been brought together to do something good and useful. And if you look at these stitches, they're not beautiful. These stitches, some of them are long and some of them are short and some of them are coming out and they're rags here, but it's still all together. And when I look at it and I look at these quilt squares, we call them quilt squares. 
And I, I see all of you. I see all of you as a square on our, on our quilt here at East End and what you have brought to this experience and who you are. You know, I see that baby in the back named George. I think he's the youngest member right now in our congregation here. And I, and I hope Miss Ruth will allow me to say, I look at our oldest member, Ruth Taylor, and she's on this quilt. And I look back there at Meg Black, I, I haven't seen for ages, and she's back, and she's on this quilt. And I'll tell you who else is on this quilt. I think, Victoria, you're on this quilt. One of these squares is for you. And I could walk up and down these aisles. I know all of you. And I know that there's a square on here for you. Now, the thread that holds it together is frayed. But after 80 years, it still holds the fabrics together. And the strength of our church is the disparate nature of our church. It's the fact that we are all different. We have all been in a different place. We have all had different experiences, and yet we have come to this place, and listen to me, and we don't have to. Nobody is here except by choice. Some of you have driven a long way. Some of you live across the street in East End, but I'm telling you that we all came here for something. And we came here, in my mind, to make a quilt and to sew these disparate pieces together for something that is useful, that will keep us warm, and will also do so much for the community. I still look at these stitches, and we have had stitches ourselves. Some of our stitches have been short, and some have been long, and some are frayed but they're still here. And this quilt is just as good as it was 80 years ago. And when I get under it, I still feel the same. And I look out there, as some of you, I think about, I just saw her this morning, Ellery Wyman came up to me and said, hey, Miss Naomi, I'm so glad to see you. What in the world could you hope for more than that? Or the fact that each of you, you know, has meant so much to me personally and I think to each other that we have put something together that is valuable, but it's valuable mostly for us. If I took this to Gatlinburg, they would put it on the trash heap. But to us, it's something special and a gift from God. I and mean, it has a strength and a history that can go forward. So here's my deal for you. Like this quilt, we've been everywhere. Sometimes I have to call up in the morning and see where we are. You know, I'm serious. You think, well, where are we today? Well, it doesn't matter. I can see the rafters. Okay, we're still here. Where are we? Well, we're out in the yard somewhere. So what? I can, I can still feel my family here. We have been up and down and round and round for two years, but we're still here. And just like us, just like this quilt, this thread that's holding it together, our love for each other and our love for Christ is holding this together under unbelievable circumstances. So here's my challenge to you. I want you to promise me that we will take this quilt back to Holly Street. You know, th this is who we are. Everybody in here is different. I mean, there's not anything about us that, uh, I mean, you look at it and you think, that doesn't match. Well, it doesn't match, but it doesn't have to. God loves us, and we love each other for our differentness and for the love that we know we have for each other. So let's make a pledge today on this kickoff of Stewardship Sunday and the announcement of our new pastor and a new beginning that we will make ourselves a, a promise to ourselves is that we will go back to Holly Street and we will take our quilt. Thank you so much. If our ushers who I have not 
spoken to earlier would come forward. <laughs> uh, we have a, a moment to give of our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift that you give us um, in our lives. We thank you for the gift of the beautiful quilt that we all get to be under. And we give back out of love and out of joy to um, continue to allow East and UMC to be a warm quilt for this congregation and for its community. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to, seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another by joining together in the common confession printed in your bulletin. God of unity and love, we confess that we do not always live in unity nor act in love. 
Have mercy upon us when we speak without love or act without humility. When we get impatient and react sharply, create in us willing hearts to live in patience and gentleness. Cleanse us with the living water of your grace. Place within each of us a spirit of hope and community. Rise us to be your children, growing toward maturity in faith and love. Hear the good news. The God of boundless love and endless grace sees us and hears us, also reaches out to us with compassion and forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and freed to walk and grow in love and in unity. Amen. Now, as people who are forgiven and freed, you are invited to greet those around you with the peace of Christ. Sorry, I made myself some notes okay, that's fine. of all the things I always forget. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No, we need our notes. We'll know it, we'll know it, we'll hear it. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. Who looks for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth and all the company in heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim the release to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, 
fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign at the hand at your right hand. And on the night which Jesus gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to invite to the table are those who will be serving communion um, and as they are coming forward I just want to remind us that this is not a United Methodist table but this is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ where all are welcome to come and receive
invite all of us to come forward for communion. The gluten-free elements will be with me in the middle. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give
give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Stand as you are able and join us in our hymn that is printed in your insert, One Bread, One Body. And now as we go, I want to encourage us this week, and maybe always, to be the quilt, to recognize that sometimes life is messy and imperfect and a little threadbare, but the things that are unseen and important will hold us together, that God will hold us together, and we will hold one another, and that itself will be a quilt to the world. So go and be a quilt. Amen. Amen.